Thank you. Please be seated, and thank you, worship team, so much. And what a great way to uh, come into a message where we need to know God's going to be with us. All your promises are yes and amen. It's uh, good to be in this section of Proverbs and looking at parenting with you this morning. And I guess my first point, <laughs> I didn't really put it down as one of my first points, but it would be please don't check out. I, there's always a tension when we come to topics that are very important and yet may not immediately seem to apply to all. And I feel that uh, tension this morning for sure. And I don't want anything this morning to be hurtful for anybody. And you may be saying, well, I'm not a parent, so do I really need to be here this morning? And I guess I would say, first of all, you may be a grandparent. You may be an ally to a parent, an aunt or an uncle by blood or maybe by relationship. You may be a mentor to someone, a friend, a youth leader, a teacher, officially big brother, a big sister. You're considering fostering or you're just a role model to somebody and someone looks up to you. Then I, I hope there will be something here that will be helpful. Paul, who was single, was a father to Timothy. And in his letters and in person, he would, he would encourage him as a parent, even though he wasn't apparent to him literally. Uh, my advanced age <clears throat> notwithstanding, I have spent more of my life not a parent still than as a parent. I was 34 years uh, before I became a parent, and don't bother doing the math, okay? <laughs> but during that time, I was learning more than I knew. I was observing. I was listening. I was seeing the way some parented. And I got some examples that were positive and others I thought, mm, maybe not so much. But I was so fortunate that my first pastor that I worked with, Dave Russell, who remains a good friend and mentor to me, uh, was at that time a young dad and a new pastor uh, at the church that I worked at. And, and I just watched him and I heard him. He himself had, uh, had, had a father who um, had been very much into ministry, but not so much around at home. And he determined to do it differently, and he guarded his, his family time jealously. No church meeting or no issue at church would ever intrude on times that were sacred with him and his family. And that, as a young pastor, meant a great deal to me. And so I, I tried to establish uh, those priorities for myself as well. Another man there, uh, he was a, a physicist and quite a, a renowned one and would travel uh, to various places uh, around the world, actually, and yet a very humble man. And he, though extremely uh, in demand, would take Monday nights and nothing could touch them. And he had four children and usually four weeks in a month. One of those children would go out with them each of those Monday nights and they got to choose the activity and the restaurant and it was undivided time with that child. And that made a, another a really strong impression on me. So that we we tried to establish what were called daddy days, you know, when, when that mattered in that stage of life. And just, again, trying to have that individual time. But I learned that by watching before I became a dad. I really, really uh, don't want you to hear me trying to pretend to be some child expert uh, this morning. Uh, that is not true. I think Carrie and I feel half the time that we're kind of making it up as we go. And maybe we've learned as much from my mistakes as, as anything. But I also don't want you to hear this morning some sort of three steps to parenting success. There are no guarantees. We are raising people who are individuals, who make choices. And Proverbs, as Pastor Dan has said often, are not promises, but rather probabilities. There are people who are terrific parents, who have done really everything, virtually everything right, and yet their children make choices in later life that are different than they would have hoped. And that, of course, can bring pain. But it does not mean that they were bad parents. We need to remember that. I cannot control my children. If I seek to control them, it will not go well. What I can do is control the kind of parent that I'm going to be. And that needs to be my emphasis, not on trying to control someone else, but controlling myself. What can I do 
to create an inviting atmosphere that encourages my children to embrace faith and live whole and healthy lives. Well, we turn to the book of Proverbs, the first thing we find very strongly is this principle, draw the line. Draw the line. It has a fair bit to say about discipline. You'll find if you're following in your outline that there are two references that are wrong. They're correct on the screen. This is one of them. I apologize. It was my mistake. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will give you the delights that you desire. This is suggesting that drawing the line is good for them and for you. Undisciplined children make life unpleasant for everyone. But there is a trap in our day. And that trap is that we want our kids to like us. We're afraid of saying no or establishing firm boundaries with the thought that somehow that might harm our children. And it's important for us to realize that establishing boundaries actually gives our children security. It's a good thing to do. It's good for everybody. Proverbs says, and this is a pretty famous one, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Do not withhold discipline from a child. A reprimand imparts wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces its mother. We need to talk about that word rod, don't we? For me, that word rod is less about the mode of discipline and more about the importance of discipline. There is definitely a debate right now about the merits or not of corporal punishment. I don't intend to enter that debate particularly this morning except to say full disclosure that we did employ mild corporal punishment as one of the tools in our toolbox up to about ages two to three. And I would say in our experience, it can be effective with careful limits. If there's an issue of danger, a hand reaching for the stove that's hot, it's not a time to suggest various consequences that might happen. It's a time for swift action and something that will immediately suggest never do that again because it could be very harmful. It may be that for willful disobedience with clear warnings and clear expectations that corporal punishment may be effective. But if so, it needs to be very carefully applied. It is to be instructive. It is never to bruise or to cause harm. Often there are better ways. A timeout, a withdrawal of privilege. Have more than one tool in the box. And whatever we do with discipline, we must respect the personhood of our children. You'll find that it's less effective with one child than with another, where with one, a rebuke alone is enough. We, two of our, our boys, and, and one of them, if you would simply come and, and say, you know, what you did made mommy very sad. That would be it. It would never happen again. Tears in the eyes. Then the other one, what you did made mommy very sad. And the look back was a look of incredulousness of what possible relevance does that have to me? <laughs> very scary at the time. He did turn out all right. <laughs> different kids, different things may be effective. Do not do it in anger. A quick-tempered person does foolish things. Sometimes it's the mom or the dad that needs the time out. Step away, ask, why am I angry? And then consider next steps. There is a power imbalance between children and adults. We must respect that and use restraint. Far more effective than one mode or another is that discipline must be consistent. 
we must have consistency, clear warnings of consequences, and follow through. If you do this, this will happen. Child will then do this, this must happen. It can't be, if you do it again, then maybe. No, you said it, do it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's so important that we understand this. No negotiating, no repeated warnings with no follow through, no pleading with our children, oh, please can't you behave. No empty threats, no ridiculous threats. If you do this, I'll throw you out the window. Well, we have no intention of throwing them out the window, I trust. <laughs> don't say it if we don't mean it. They're, they're not dumb. They figure us out pretty quick. Do we mean it or not? Draw the line. Set boundaries carefully, clearly, generously. Try to say yes more then you say no. Set your boundaries, but then keep them. And the beautiful thing is that if you're really firm at first in those early years, you can relax later because the boundaries have been set. And it's wonderful. Now, it could be that some of our boundaries were maybe a little too strict at first, first children. We learned as we get, went on. But it was important that we kept them. My son seemed to hear me in more absolute terms than we intended. He came home from a week of camp, and he still had his tuck money with him. Why didn't you spend your money at camp? Well, um, I thought I wasn't allowed to drink Coke. We had never said that. I promise you we hadn't. But he had interpreted us, because we didn't have it in the house, that it was somehow forbidden. And so uh, some years later, this is just a few years ago, around the table, all our kids were sitting there and they were having a good laugh at my expense about all the times that they'd snuck down to watch some forbidden program and uh, how there was a certain step that squeaked and you had to step over that so he didn't wake up the parents and they went down. And they said, you know, every time you came into the room, we just changed it from Pokemon to Barney, you know, and then it was... It was <laughs> It was okay. And uh, that was great, except my, my youngest was also at the table, and uh, she started to tell about something she had done. And the only problem was that she had done it like two weeks before, and the guys are like, statute of limitations hasn't run out on that yet. <laughs> Consistency. Children will test the line, but they will find security when they're established. And the beautiful thing is that this is a benefit to you. It makes life easier for you as well. They will soon learn, if you're firm and consistent, that there's no point asking the fourth and the fifth time. It's not going to work. We had a family at the cottage one time, and let's just say that those parents um, discipline differently than what I'm describing. Let's just say that. And uh, so there's lots of negotiating and pleading and, 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 and so on. Uh, and he wanted a boat ride. And he was asking and asking. And so finally, I looked him in the eye and said, you'll find that when I say something, I mean it. And I don't change my mind. So here's what's going to happen. You're not going to mention the word boat for half an hour. Silence for half an hour. We went on our boat ride. No pleading. No, can I, can I? It was wonderful. It can work. Discipline your children, and they will give you peace they will bring you the delights that you desire. But the purpose and motivation behind discipline has got to be love. We have such a beautiful model in this. The Lord disciplines those he loves. It's not loving to ignore actions and attitudes that will harm our children. The writer of Hebrews can look back and say, our parents disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, and we respected them for it. In the end, we are seeking to raise individuals who will choose wisely. And part of that learning is that there are consequences in life to wrong choices. It's so much better to learn that early before the stakes get higher. Draw the line. Secondly, speak into life. Proverbs and scripture in general has a lot to say about the power of our words for good 
or for ill. Our words can bring life to someone or can cause them serious harm. The mouth of the righteous, we read, is a fountain of life. Gracious words promote instruction, or can be translated, gracious words make a person persuasive. People will listen to us better, possibly, if our words are gracious. The lips of the righteous nourish many. It's so important to consider how I use my words with my children because my tongue, the tongue, has power of life and death. James writes, with the tongue, we can praise our Lord and Father. We did it here already today. But we can go out and with it we can curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And you say, well, I would never curse my children. Ah, but wait. If we make statements like, you always do this. You never do this. You are such a fill in the blank. You're beyond hope. You idiot. You're so stupid. These words that we might say in a moment of frustration and not mean can go to the heart of our children and hurt and sit there like a curse. I'm a loser. My dad said so. I have an example, I'm afraid, from my own life. I have uh, one of my sons growing up unimaginable room. You have no, there's no words to describe his room. Science experiments were growing in various parts of the room. There, there, there's no, no words could ever describe it. And in a moment of frustration, I went in, and I know what I meant, but I said words that, I, oh, I wish I could take, have taken back. We didn't raise you right. I meant we should have picked on this earlier. I don't know what I meant. But it went like a knife into his spirit. And fortunately, my other son came to me and said, Dad, you're a little rough. So I went, and we all sat down, the three of us, and, and I apologized, and, I, and then I listened. <laughs> and boy, did I ever hear stuff. But I listened, and I realized that my words had been like a curse. Now, there's irony in life, because that same young man, now an adult and living on his own, his apartment is absolutely fastidious. It is absolutely clean. Everything is in place. Marie Kondo would be out of a job if she went to his apartment. And he comes to our place and says, yeah, I don't know how you live like this, you know. <laughs> Life is funny. So this thing I thought was so important at that time kind of worked itself out okay. We can speak hope-filled words, words of grace, encouragement, or words of despair, killing words. And our children are listening to us. When we talk about other people, when we have discussions at the table or in the car, and we're talking about people we disagree with, maybe over politics, or maybe we make remarks about people of the other gender, or people whose sexuality is different, uh, or whose race is different. Little ears are listening. And they're asking, would I be accepted if I disagreed with mom and dad? What if they later meet these people we talk about in generalities and find them, in fact, to be wonderful, kind, and intelligent? What will they make of our judgments? Try to steer towards peace and reconciliation. Don't continue to nag about something and bring up past mistakes and arguments. Solomon writes, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. We're not there to stir up trouble. If I find myself angry, I need to ask, is there some goal I had that is being blocked? And if so, I maybe need to deal with this. I don't need to be right. I maybe need to come and apologize for my attitude. A gentle answer turns away wrath, and a harsh word stirs up anger. James writes, we all stumble in many ways, 
Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Anybody? No, I didn't think so. None of us are perfect. We mess up all the time. We stumble in many ways, James says. So we're not always going to get it right. We just got to be ready with the sorry. We got to be ready and acknowledge what we did. We're not perfect. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Choose words that give life and encouragement. Say, I love you, often. Words of affection. Words of reconciliation. I'm sorry. Words of vision. I see this in you. If, I'm going to say particularly our daughters come to us, and if we, do we, if they uh, are strong, do we say to them, you're bossy, or do we say, I see leadership in you? Vision. What do we see in them? Words of security. I will always love you. No matter what happens, no matter what you do, you will always be my son. You will always be my daughter, no matter what. We're creating an environment where it is safe for them to come and talk to us, no matter what. If they make choices that are not what I might have chosen, if, in fact, they get themselves in trouble in some way, I want them to know they can still come to me. I want them to know that. And so I said early on, before it was even at that stage of life, if you find yourself at a party, maybe there's been alcohol, maybe there's been things happening there and you're uncomfortable, maybe you've even uh, taken part in it, you can call me anytime on the phone. I will come, I will pick you up, no questions asked. I want them to know that, that it's a safe place to talk. Keep the conversation going. It's so important. If I trust my children, they'll rise up to it. If I tell them their failures, they'll basically lose heart and say, why bother? We can't please him. We need to model supportive speech, supportive speech towards our partner. If we're married and we're co-parenting, we need to support the other parent. That's, that's so important because kids will see cracks in that in a minute, right? If, if mom says no, ask dad. Um, and uh, it, we, we can't do that. You know, we've got to be on the same page together. Now, is this always easy? No. And I say, like, if you are a single parent, I mean, you deserve a medal. That is hard, hard job. And if you're separated or divorced and you have kids together, that's hard. I have seen, I have friends that are in that situation, and they co-parent together very well, even though in their relationship they are apart. But it's tough. You need to see Paul's words there, wherever possible, in as much as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Keep the conversation going. I may not like everything I hear from my kids, but I want to hear it. Now, nothing will stop them from talking to me quicker than if I start to do commentary on everything they say. Oh, that's not very nice. Oh, that wasn't very good. Oh, that person's not very... You know the conversation will not go on much longer. I need to just listen. I may not like it, but I need to listen. Occasionally, they may ask, and I may have an opportunity to say some things. Keep the conversation going. Do I create a climate where someone wants to share? Listen. There's a concept in the Bible which we don't necessarily have big in our culture, and that's the concept of blessing, of intentional blessing. And it's too bad it's not an intentional thing in our culture because it's a need that is very, very core and basic in all of our lives. There's this longing that we have that our parents love us, approve of us, value us, know us, and respect us for who we are. There's a story about a man called Esau, and his brother Jacob cheated him out of uh, a blessing, and it's, it's got lots of cultural stuff going on. But listen to the cry of this man. He's 40 years old, speaking to his father, 
longing for his blessing. Oh, bless me also, O oh my father. Do you only have one blessing? So Esau lifted his voice and wept. He's 40 years old, but longing for the blessing of his father. And if our children don't get the blessing from us, they will look for it elsewhere, and not all of those places will be healthy. Hear it in that, do I look okay? Hey, I scored a goal. Come see my new car. I graduated. Did you see the mark I got? That confidence. Now, it, we can be quite sure that Jesus didn't need his, his approval in the way that we do, but my goodness, was it ever beautiful to see at Jesus' baptism, the heavens open, and here's the Father, and he's looking down and saying, this is my beloved Son. I am so pleased with him. So then when he's then driven out and Satan is tempting him and saying, hey, if you're the Son of God, I'm not sure you really are. If you're the Son of God and... Jesus has confidence because he says, I know my father loves me. He just told me so. He knew he had his father's blessing. If Jesus wanted to have that blessing, so our children, in words that are, are, are different than these, no doubt, we need to say, you are my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. I delight over you, my son. And if you never received that blessing from your parent, you have the privilege now to start a new line of blessing. Speak the truth. The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. We want as parents to leave a legacy of truth-telling, meaning what we say, promising carefully and then following through with it. It's not do what I say, not what I do. That's not effective. It's be truth tellers. My parents were amazing. And one thing they did really well is they were truth tellers. I remember a couple of incidents that really impacted me as a kid. A young girl was over and my cousin was there and the young girl was reaching for candy. And my cousin said, she was young, she said, oh, it's not candy. You wouldn't like it. And my dad gently put his hand on her, on her hand and said, it, it is candy. You can't have any right now because it's right before dinner, but we're not going to lie. And that impacted me early. I was about five years old, I think, when I looked at my mom. If your kids are here, fingers in the ears, full disclaimer. Is there a Santa Claus? She didn't want to lie. She said, no, there's, there's not a Santa Claus. Now, what she didn't know is that I would then go through the mall and see the mall Santa and shake my fist and say, faker! I was uh, an odd child. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, well, it hasn't changed much, but anyway. <laughs> now, a couple of years later, they were able to say to me, because I asked them, I said, no, we have never lied to you. Now, you can do what you want with Santa. There's a place for pretend, and I get that. Boy, was it ever a rich gift they gave me when I knew that they always told me the truth. I want to give that gift to my children. And I suppose I went a little far in my desire to do that as well. When my son's hamster died, for example, and we were on the way home, Daddy, is my hamster in heaven? I said, no, son. To your, anyway, to your. <laughs> if I'd had half a brain, I could have said something like, what do you think? But anyway, my heart was in the right place. <laughs> Study your child. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. This verse, of course, is, is quite famous, and it's one that we really need to emphasize is a probability, not a, a promise. It's an observation. It means you start someone off on a way, and, and they're likely to continue going in that direction. But there's a, something we miss. On the way that they should go is singular, and it has an article, which means it's a specific way. Train up the child according to his way, the specific way that child should go. Become a student of your child, each one of them. Value their uniqueness. Show no partiality. In words or in attitudes, never think or say, why can't you be more like? You don't want them to be more like. You want them to be the full uniqueness 
of who they are as individuals. And that's so, so important. Delighting in each one fully and individually. To show partiality in judging is not good. Observe deeply. What is their love language? What is their toleration for humor or teasing? Are words that I say particularly hurtful to that one? What is their specific learning style, their educational path, their hobbies, their interaction? The hobbies that you love, the things that were so important to you, may not be the thing that they really get excited about, and that's got to be okay. What is their path? We may naturally, more naturally, understand one of our children more than another. But then we need to work to value the one who is different from us and celebrate their uniqueness. Our first child came to us, and, and he did everything by the book. And we were awesome parents. We, we could have written a book. It was great. And then the second one came along, and he blew the book apart. And it was uh, wonderful to see that all four of our children are delightfully different, and they also have different ways of expressing their love back to us. They don't all have to be the same. Well, there's, uh, of course, the five love languages, and some of you are familiar with them, so let's just have a look at that uh, slide, the five love languages here. And we need to discover what are my, what is this child's love language? In other words, which one of these things will really speak to them? Is it a word of affirmation? Is that what they're really craving? Is it quality time, spending good time with them? Is it a, a special gift on an important occasion? Is it an act of service, or is it meaningful touch, or some combination of those, but all of our children will be different, and we can be shouting, I love you, in one of these languages, and they ain't hearing it. We need to speak in their language. Know your job. This one's hard. The role of a parent morphs dramatically over the years. And making those adjustments quickly enough is not always easy. Understanding the changing seasons of life, and it happens all too soon. It's like, oh my goodness, are we here already at this stage? And there's those transitions, and, and the question continues to be, what's the best thing to say at this stage? It may no longer be appropriate to say certain things. That day may be past. Like apples of gold in settings of silver, Solomon writes, is a word spoken in the right circumstances. What are the right words at the right time? Consider carefully. Here again, one of the references is wrong. See the screen. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. And whoever has understanding is even-tempered. Increasingly, we need to listen more and comment less. I've suggested some roles here that may be part of, uh, of our transition. It may start out as a caregiver. At first, it's just looking after their needs. Then a corrector, making sure they're doing things right, they're staying out of danger, learning the manners. Commander, captain. But then maybe it morphs into more of a coach where you're kind of on the sidelines and, and, and calling the plays, but they're really doing the work. Maybe ultimately it's just a cheerleader, someone from the sidelines going, yes, you're doing great. And if you're lucky, ultimately an adult to adult companion. Whatever stage you're in, the time is now. Don't withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do so. It's a limited time offer on these stages. And there's a time and a season for each kind of interaction. Howard Hendricks, I heard him speak once, and I'll never forget this one statement he made. He said, I don't understand everything I know. But I know that the more I let my children go and give them freedom, the more they want to be around. 
hands off. Honor their emerging adulthood. Honor their marriage and the sanctity of that marriage. Honor their parenting style. That can be hard. My mom was so good at this. She would come along, isn't it true, Carrie? And she would, she would say, Carrie, you're doing great. You're such a good mom. And it was so helpful to us at that point. Be in their corner. It's no longer time for unsolicited advice. Play the long game. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. <laughs> You're thinking, if you've got young kids, I'm just trying to get through today. Don't talk about children's children. But this is the long view here. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they won't turn from it. Start early and then see to the far horizon. Good habits persist. The long game. Early actions matter for better or for worse. But over the course of time, we may let, have to let them make some mistakes and not sweat the small stuff. We don't have to solve everything right in that moment. We're playing the long game. And sometimes we have to kind of watch and say our piece, but then back off a little bit. Pick our battles. Keep the no list short. Keep listening and try not to erect walls. I want to say to you, please avoid ultimatums. I know someone who said to his daughter, no daughter of mine will ever have a tattoo and live in my house. You know what she did the next day, don't you? She got a tattoo, and she's now living in her boyfriend's house. Not a win, Dad. Avoid ultimatums. Recently had a conversation with uh, uh, a couple of my, my adult children, and it was on a controversial subject, and, and they had a different view than I had on that controversial subject. And we had a great discussion. But I'm not coming to that as sort of dad with the truth, listen, son, but rather I'm doing the listening. I'm learning their perspective and maybe also giving my in input into the conversation. Discussion, not argument. It's not worth it. Keep the relationship. Play the long game. Down the generations. Start a new line of blessing. It's true and sobering that the consequences of my sin can reverberate down three or four generations, but it's also true that God remembers his covenant not to three or four, but to a thousand generations of those who love him. God is playing the long game with us. As a parent, I cannot be needy. I cannot need my children's approval. My children cannot fill my needs. They cannot heal a marriage. They cannot complete me. Their achievements can't somehow fulfill my dreams or some goal of mine. They are their dreams, not mine. Win the heart. My child, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. I love this. It's not so much that we say this literally to our children, but it certainly is the goal of our parenting. The Old Testament ends with this hope that one would come who would turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children. And our hope is that somehow that our children would see our way of life, our values, and say, that looks like a good way to live. That we make faith and goodness attractive. And there are, of course, ways that we can effectively lose the hearts of our kids. Number one is by being unreasonable. Fathers, do not embitter or exasperate your children, Paul writes, or they will become discouraged. Watch for it. Causing them to lose heart, to give up, to conclude it's impossible to please you. That's exasperating our children. They become discouraged. They stop trying. If we are inconsistent, unreasonable, if we show favoritism, seek to manipulate or have rigid demands or continue to nag, at worst, if there is verbal, emotional, physical, even sexual abuse, 
And I will only say it that if you think there might be a chance that that's a danger for you, please get help now. Don't wait. Proverbs begins, listen, son, it's tender, it's relational. Your father, your mother, we want wisdom to enter your heart. We want to make knowledge pleasant. Hearts are one with love, not with power. Our goal is to win the heart, not the argument. We need to parent with humility. Remember, we were kids too, still are, in fact, children of our Heavenly Father, and we are not perfect. We are not unquestioned authorities. Solomon remembers, I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Remember that we too had to learn and that we all meet with our kids at the cross, under the shadow of the cross, all sinners in need of Jesus' mercy. All imperfect. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. If we never admit we're wrong, we will lose their hearts. Don't crush their spirits. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We need to hear the heart cry of our kids, their dreams, their goals. If we continually put them off, we'll do that another day, maybe next year. If we don't take them seriously, assuming we know better, we can make their hearts sick with empty promises and false hopes and dreams not listened to. The human spirit can endure sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? And this is why it's so critical to sense when we have grieved our children and hurt them and embittered them and crushed their spirits and be quick to seek forgiveness. Forgiveness, the language of family. Everyone needs to speak it. Jesus to Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven, 490 times a day without enabling our kids, without rescuing them from all consequence, but ready to forgive. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. If I could paraphrase Paul's advice to Timothy, his son in the faith, he said, the Lord's servant, or, or dad, mom, should not be quarrelsome, but be kind to her children, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting them when they mess up. Life-giving parenting. Our children are on loan to us. We do not own them. Give me your heart, my child. Let your eyes delight in my ways. The heart is what we are seeking to win. We want our children to discover their own faith, to see our lives and find our way of life attractive. And with loving persuasion, invite them to faith. Unconditional love. Relationship into ad adulthood without condition. You will always be my child. And finally, living in hope. It's so easy to read all these things. Do this, do this, do this, and just get this heaviness. And that's the last thing I want to say. I want to say rather that we're not in this alone. We can parent in hope. We have a God who is with us. Paul writes, he says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And it just may depend on the day, which one of those we're going to park on, because there are really good days as parents. And we can be joyful in hope. And then there's other days at, as parents when we need to be patient in affliction. And days where there's nowhere else to go. And we need to be faithful in prayer. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we parent, as we trust in him, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not in this alone. The God of hope is with us. We have the Holy Spirit. And this is the God who is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. Call to me and I will answer you, he says. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. He's in there with us. And if we don't parent in hope, we will parent in fear 
And fear-based parenting will cause us to bubble wrap our kids spiritually, become suspicious and reactive, and that's not healthy. God, the great parent, knows our pain. The pain of a parent can be acute. God knows. He has had some billions of imperfect, rebellious kids, and he knows our pain. He is our perfect model. He loves unconditionally, and he gives grace. The father of the prodigal son, shown to us in Scripture as a model of the perfect father, God himself, in the story, this perfect father has two boys, and both of them have significant issues. Perfect parent, children with issues. He understands our pain. He doesn't want us to live in shame. It's another very sobering thing about the book of Proverbs, and that's the fact that Solomon wrote it. Solomon was very wise, and he wrote a lot of wise things in the book. Sad thing is, he didn't follow through with his own wisdom. He made some very unfortunate choices, and in the process, lost his family and lost his kingdom. It's so important that we not just know what to do, but that we actually do it. And so in that spirit, I want to show you these wisdom opportunities, and these are just a few of of many that might be available. I want to show you the first one, and the arrow's pointing to a table. The best thing you can do is have a family table, have a family meal. It's hard. Music lessons, sports events, there's just everything's pulling it away. Phones. Have a family table. Have a time established when you all come together and you look each other in the eye. We are family. Disconnect so that you can connect. And we need to disconnect too. Be there at that family table. The other, there's, there's some good books out there. These are just a few. Love languages for your children. There's one for teens. Grace-based parenting. I'd had three boys and thought, I don't know anything about girls. I got the book. Um, she calls me daddy and I found that really helpful. There are other uh, things out there. But you know, it could be that you just come alongside another couple. Maybe there are a couple more years down the road and and, and just sort of, hey, can we learn from you? Like, what were some of the good things you did? What were the, some of the mistakes? You, you, you wouldn't do that again. And, and learn from, from other couples. Counseling. We think of going to the dentist, and we go for a checkup. But if you don't go for a checkup, and you just go for the root canal, like, that's, that's wait until it's really serious. But counseling doesn't have to be that. Counseling doesn't have to be when there's a root canal, a really big problem. It can be, you know what, we can maybe freshen this up a bit. Maybe there's some strategies we could learn. And that would be a great thing to do. Finally, I'm going to ask Sherry Burgess to come, and she's going to pray for families. Sherry, I just really appreciate that you're doing this. And uh, she's going to come and just pray for parents this morning. And because we're not in this alone, and we want God to help us. So let's pray together. I thank you for this church where um, your word is taught and your name is proclaimed. I thank you for Pastor Gordon and Pastor Dan who have a heart to see families and marriages strong and healthy and thriving. I thank you for your word that has so many wise principles and um, advice to help us in, in raising our families well. And Father, mostly I thank you for Holy Spirit who is always with us, that we can turn to for wisdom and guidance and following your ways, for timely words. Father, remind us to pray for our children and, and for us as parents in raising our children. Father, your word says when we rise up, when we lay down, when we go in, when we go out, to speak to our children about you. <clears throat> Lord, help us to do that. Help us to um, teach our children to know you, to love you, to walk with you, to stand for you, to share you, to obey you, and to serve you. Father, we ask that you would fill our homes with love and with laughter, and that our homes would be places where you are honored. And all of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 